Good afternoon. I'd like to start by polling the audience. Could you please raise your hand if you did an extracurricular in high school or in college? Okay, hands down, very involved group. Now, can you please raise your hand if that activity had a big impact on you, on who you are today? Okay, thank you. I like to start there because the activities that we fill our lives with are important. They've had a big impact on us. And the activities that we fill our lives with are places where systems of power and privilege are reproduced. So sports, the arts, these places are not divorced from the rest of the world. My extracurricular is ultimate frisbee. I started playing in college and I just fell in love with the sport. These days I'm coaching, I'm still playing competitively and I'm organizing. And a lot of people ask me, why do you put so much time into a sports community? And my answer is simple. If you believe in social change, then I believe you have a responsibility to work in your own community. And the ultimate community is not only my community, it's become my home. That leads me to my next two questions for you. Could you please raise your hand if you identify with the statement, I believe in social change? Okay, passionate crew, hands down. Last question for you. Please raise your hand if you've ever had someone talk past you in a conversation. Almost everybody, all right, put your hands down. So no surprise, really, really passionate group of people here. You believe in social change. You believe in social justice. And most of you have had the experience of having someone just as passionate as you talk past you. Often, as organizers, as activists, we see someone over here and we want to move them over here. But this is the space of talking past someone. So when we're in a conversation, when we're organizing a training or a workshop, this can't be our goal. Our goal has to be here. And it's this space that I'm focused on today. Ultimate has its roots in counterculture, and we still retain a lot of that zest, a lot of that energy. But the sport has grown up a lot since the 1970s. You might think of the stereotype of barefoot, pot-smoking players, and those definitely still exist. But mostly, we've grown up into a really competitive sport with competitive college programs that recruit. We play on the international level. 43 countries are playing Ultimate. Today, in the US, the ultimate community is mostly higher income, white, very well educated, and considers themselves to be progressive. Now, despite this progressive self-identification, the disparaging of women's ultimate and of female athletes in general is very commonplace. So you hear comments like, oh, women's ultimate, that's like ultimate being played underwater. That's not competitive. Or female athletes aren't explosive. They're biologically disadvantaged to men. So all of the same sexist attitudes that we hear in every other sports community exist in our own. Now, as an advocate for female players, I have found this progressive self-identification to be a very big obstacle. Think of yourself. Do you consider yourself to be progressive? I do. And when I think about myself as progressive, I sort of puff up my chest. I feel really enlightened, right? I'm doing it better than everybody else over there. I've, I've thought it through more than they have. And if that's how we're approaching things, then we generally don't think we have a lot of room to grow. And if we don't think we have a lot of room to grow, we're not likely to hear the ways in which we need to change. But I really understand this false progressiveness. I have done this many times. So for example, when I was growing up, I thought I could either be a respected person or I could be a girl. I didn't see those things overlapping. I thought, wow, OK, so all of these male qualities in my sort of heteronormative binary sense of the, word, of the world, all these male qualities seem really, really cool. These female qualities don't seem that great. I want to be a leader. I want to be respected as an intellectual. I want to be an athlete. Those are things that were attractive to me. So fast forward, I go to college and I join the ultimate team. And this is the first group of women that I feel really connected to, that I feel like, wow, I can be my fully you know, multidimensional self with these women. So I'm so excited that whole first year to take a 17-hour road trip down to Savannah, Georgia. It's like a pilgrimage for the team over spring break. We're in the car, a van filled with six or seven women, and we start having a conversation about our experiences in high school, and it turns out that we have a lot in common. We're all kind of tomboys. And we said, oh, yeah, you know, this is the first group of women I really feel connected to. Yeah, me too, me too. And then another girl says, yeah, you know, I don't really like women. We all go, yeah, me too. Yeah, I don't really like women. And our captain, she stops us and she says, hold on, hold on. 
So you all say that you're strong women and you all say that you're fighting for equality, but you're so quick to put down your own gender. And this was a huge moment for me. I mean, in my life, I trace back so many things here because in that moment, I realized that I was sexist. And in that moment, I realized that I needed to change. Now, this is a moment that as organizers, as activists, we overlook quite often, which is that a prerequisite for change is that people need to see the need to change. So when you're trying to get someone from here to here, if you're focusing here, that's getting them to see the need. Saul Alinsky, in his book, Rules for Radicals, which is about community organizing, says that before we have revolution, we need to have a reformation. That is, before we ask someone to take a revolutionary leap, we need to build a foundation from which they can jump. Last year, I co-founded a national initiative called the Girls' Ultimate Movement, or GUM. Our goal is simple. We want to grow the number of girls playing at the youth level in the US. Now, right now, there are 13,000 youth playing, and only 3,000 of them are girls. And this gap is growing very quickly. I'm really proud of what we're doing with GUM. I mean, we've energized local communities. People are on board. People are running clinics. We are building a national volunteer structure, girls-focused curriculum, piloting programs. But the thing that I'm most excited about is that I see GUM as a kind of reformation, as part of a reformation within the community. Because we want to build a culture within this sports community where the most socially accessible thing you can do is to support girls and women. We want to foster a culture where growing the number of girls playing is seen as a community issue, and it's not siloed as a women's issue. Now, when I have conversations about this, I often go in at Feminism 300 when I should go in at Feminism 101. I often talk past people. I've made a lot of mistakes. But in those moments, I think of my own moments of false progressiveness, those moments when I thought I didn't need to change. And that makes me more humble, that makes me more patient, and that makes me a better advocate for girls and women. Now, when you go out and you're working in your own communities, I challenge you. Think of your own moments of false progressiveness. Think of your own personal moments of reformation and think of how those moments have allowed you to take revolutionary leaps. Thank you.